Hi, I'm Steve Peterson, senior author of an article entitled Functional, Aerial, and System Organization of a Highly Sampled Individual Human Brain. For the next few minutes, Tim Lauman, lead author of this article, will be describing our resting state studies of this individual, showing how he ha shares many things in common with all of us while having some distinct differences from the group. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Timothy Lauman. The human brain is organized into functional areas and systems, that is, regions and networks of regions that are specialized for particular kinds of information processing. For example, visual processing in the occipital cortex, motor and somatosensory processing along the central sulcus, and even different types of control systems in the frontal and parietal regions of cortex. Many investigators have begun using resting state functional MRI to interrogate the functional organization of the human brain. This technique measures patterns of correlations between low frequency fluctuations in the bold signal while a subject lies at rest in an MRI scanner. This approach has been highly successful in identifying functional systems and basic organizational properties of the brain and presents significant potential for in vivo understanding of both normal and pathological physiology. However, the human brain exhibits a substantial degree of functional and anatomical variability. Thus, while this is a powerful representation of a population, the group averaging used here necessarily obscures the patterns of organization specific to a given individual. Therefore, in this study, we have taken a deep dive into the aerial and the system organization of a single human being using a massive data set collected by one of our authors on himself, allowing us to assess and account for different sources of variability. I'll let one of the other authors, who I know has spent a lot of time in the scanner, explain this data set. Hi, I'm not Russ Pobrat. I'm Avi Snyder. Russ couldn't be here because he is attending to important scientific matters. But I can tell you about the data set he collected. A few years ago, inspired by various investigators who have attempted extensive longitudinal self-examination and being interested in how the brain may vary over long periods of time, Russ began collecting MR data repeatedly on himself. The scans were obtained at fixed times of day, a couple of times a week, whenever he was available. Altogether, Russ obtained over 100 10-minute resting state scans, 84 of which are used in the presently published study. With this data in hand, we adapted the most recent techniques for analyzing resting state data to obtain a cortical aerial parcellation as well as a systems-level description of this individual's brain. The aerial parcellation was defined using the gradient-based technique described in earlier work from our lab. This method relies on the observation that patterns of resting state functional connectivity abruptly change across the cortical surface. These abrupt transitions are presumed to reflect boundaries between cortical areas. We can apply this strategy across the entire brain and obtain an individualized parcellation. A key question for this investigation was determining how much data is needed to obtain a given level of precision in the correlation estimates. Using the individually defined parcels to generate a correlation network, we show that near-perfect reproducibility is obtained when two halves of the data, each including 380 minutes of rest, are compared to each other. Using one half of the data to define the true functional connectivity result, one can then ask how reproducibility depends on the quantity of data taken from the other half. We observe that reproducibility steeply increases up to 25 to 30 minutes of data, and begins to converge by 90 to 100 minutes. This empirical curve follows very closely a model of correlation and reproducibility that depends only on two parameters, the sampling error and the range of correlation values in the set of parcel pairs. The very small discrepancy between the model and the empirical data can be explained by residual sources of day-to-day -day variability. For example, that on some days the subject was caffeinated and fed, while on others he was fasting in preparation for a blood draw. These unaccounted sources of variability can be incorporated into a corrected model that nearly perfectly reproduces the empirical data. 
Interestingly, if we look directly at the standard deviation of the correlation estimates across days, there is increased variability in visual and somatomotor regions. This pattern of within-subject variability is in clear contrast to across-subject variability, which is concentrated in frontal and parietal regions. These differences speak to the different sources of variability between, as opposed to within, subjects. Finally, using an InfoMap-based community detection procedure, we are able to directly compare the system organization of the individual with that obtained from a group average of 120 subjects. Notably, the individual has many of the same systems as are observed in the group. In fact, even detailed features of these systems can be observed in both datasets, as we can see in the default mode and frontal parietal systems. Some important exceptions to this general similarity include the presence of a primary visual system in the individual, but not in the group, and the lack of a ventral somatomotor system in the individual that was present in the group. These differences are explained by the fact that the individual had his eyes closed during the resting scans, while the subjects in the group were collected with their eyes open. Most intriguing, however, is that if we look closely at the individual, we can see focal regions of various systems that are not present in the group map. For example, we can see that in the lateral frontal cortex, there is a patch of purple just above the lip of the operculum that is not apparent in the group. Two neighboring regions in this area have nearly identical correlation maps in the group, while in the individual, they belong to entirely different systems. In fact, if we directly compare the correlation maps between the individual and the group, vertex by vertex, focal distinctions like this can be observed across the cortex. Such distinctions may be related to inadequate registration among the subjects in the group, but may also represent the possibility that individuals have true topological distinctions between each other at the system level. This fascinating possibility may have implications for trying to characterize individual differences in functional organization and motivates further studies of this type with highly sampled individuals. There are several other interesting observations and details included in the article that I did not have time to go into here so I encourage you to take a closer look. I would like to thank Neuron for giving us the opportunity to present our work both in print and in the form of this video abstract. I would also like to thank all our sources of funding, and most importantly, all the authors for their contributions, especially those crazy distinct few who thought it would be fun to spend a large chunk of their lives inside a scanner. Viola.